based all my questions mainly on the uh, advanced copy that I got. So I hope there aren't <laughs> dramatic differences <laughs> in, in this version. If I were writing a review, I would have gotten that. Uh, <laughs> Double check, you know. Page references here. Not that I'm going <laughs> to use them, but they're they're uh, in my copy. Are we, are we good, Tom? Yeah. Thumbs up. All right. Good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, to Politics and Prose. I'm I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, al along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine, and. Uh, let me just say at the start how um, truly exciting it is to be uh, holding this event uh, in, in person, you know, after a two-year interruption uh, because, of course, of uh, – well, there's some <laughs> applause out in the audience uh, – two-year interruption because of the, um, of the pandemic. We resumed in-person events here o uh, only uh, earlier this month. And uh, while, while we'll continue to, uh, to do some events online, uh, in, in, in the weeks ahead, we're planning to schedule more and more in person as the, uh, as the pandemic recedes. Um, you know, as a business, we're, we're not quite yet fully back to uh, where we were before the pandemic, but, um, but we're getting there, and I do remain confident about, about the future. Uh, now, speaking about the future of uh, not just PNP, but uh, bookstores generally. We're especially delighted to have Jeff Deutsch uh, with us this evening here to talk about his new book, In Praise of Good Bookstores. Uh, Jeff, uh, who's a bookseller himself, not only has a very deep understanding of the business, but a gifted way of describing what's wonderful about it and also why it, it's endangered. Uh, but before s saying more about Jeff and his book, let me uh, just mention a couple of brief housekeeping uh, notes. Um, you know, we have lifted the mask mandate uh, here at, at the store, but you're all encouraged to wear a mask, particularly for events, and, and uh, we can provide one if you if you need it. Uh, and for the Q and A later in the talk, if you have a question, just uh, step up to to that that microphone. Uh, and also at the end of the event, our staff would really appreciate it if you fold up the chairs that you're sitting in and, and lean them against um, a pillar or a bookcase uh, or something that looks like it won't topple over. Okay, <clears throat> back to Jeff. Um, now, he's been a, a bookseller since uh, 1994. Uh, for 20 years, he worked in some large and serious bookstores uh, around the, the country. And then in uh, 2014, he took over as director of Chicago's Seminary Co-op Bookstores, and you'll, you'll hear more about this much respected uh, bookstore uh, in, in a minute. Uh, in his book, Jeff reflects uh, on the importance of, of bookstores and the challenges they face uh, staying in business. He writes really quite eloquently and makes extensive use of quotations from a wide range of, of authors and other thinkers, and I, I'm not going to be able to convey just how erudite and, and lyrical and, and passionate the book is. Uh, but, but the basic case that Jeff makes is this. Uh, for, for bookstores to survive, he says, they'll need a, a different financial model than the traditional retail one uh, that we've all been operating under uh, for, for years now. Uh, because, well, it's, um, the old model just, just isn't working. Uh, and Jeff does, um, does offer some alternatives, which we will also spend a little time discussing uh, uh, a bit later. So, Jeff, welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be back in this space. It's a beautiful store. It's expanded since I saw it last, which is incredible to think about stores like this growing. And one of the things that I'm hopeful for in the future is that every neighborhood or community that wants a bookstore like this can have one. I can't argue with that. Um, so, um, let's talk first about where your own love of books comes from. I mean, you, you grew up, of course, in a in an Orthodox Jewish community in and around Brooklyn, and uh, you write in, in, in your book about how, you know, the rooms that you remember from your childhood were all book-lined, and, um, and how books carried a particular reverence and, and love for you, and you, you talk uh, in particular about how your grandfather's library made such a deep impression on you. So, how, uh, 
Well, how, how so? Yeah, thank you for that question. And it's really, it's, it's uh, special for me to think about where my love for books comes from, but more importantly, almost book spaces. I actually was a reluctant reader. I didn't read much at all. Um, I would look to the last page to see how many uh, pages were in the book. If it was over 200, I basically would put it back on the shelf. I just needed something quick. Uh, I would sneak Mad Magazine into my uh, Talmud or Sitter uh, in order to read something that, that would entertain me. So I wasn't a reader at all, but there was a, the presence of books was a critical part of my childhood. There were books everywhere. All of my, my friends' uh, houses, my, you know, our house, uh, the, the school I went to, the yeshiva, the shuls, all the places that I went, there were books everywhere. And they were, they were objects that I was interacting with. And what became clear to me as I then became a reader in my teenage years was that that living with those books and being among them was actually its own reward. There was something separate even from reading that was important to me. And as I became, uh, you know, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life and for a career, I knew for sure that the presence of books was going to be important too. I felt most comfortable in book line spaces. Uh, it's amazing that I can even look at you or at the audience. I'm like, my eyes are scanning the shelves. I'm seeing the Library of America James Baldwin over there, which I'm really excited by. And there's a new version, actually, of uh, the nonfiction, the complete uh, Baldwin nonfiction with uncollected essays that you have at the front, which is incredible. There's a Joyce Ulysses that Other Press just put out over here. Uh, You're hired. <laughs> oh, listen, I, I do for a living. <laughs> and, the, and the point, though, is that like I'm actually, while I'm in, you know, taking in, in the room, um, that Ulysses, by the way, is incredible. And I will say I got married on Bloomsday, uh, which is a special thing. It recalls my marriage, and it recalls the first time I read it, sitting outside smoking a carton of cigarettes over a week of vacation. That's all I did was smoke and read for that week. And that, like, the, the, these evocative spots throughout the store and my sight lines are things that I wouldn't get just wandering um, in a different space. And I think that that piece of it is critically important when thinking about what is the value of a bookstore, right? And it is the presence of books. Well, so so in time, you know, you developed this yourself this reverence for for reading and and, and saw it as an as essential, you know, part of a meaningful life, but not necessarily a means to a living. So so how is it that you did end up <laughs> selling books? Right. Well, that's a that's a that's a good point. So in the tradition that I come out of, which is uh, an Orthodox Jewish tradition in and around New York, um, the idea of becoming educated the way that we have that in um, in our current culture, where one goes to a university, potentially grad school, potentially a PhD program, but some institution that will ultimately stamp the students as educated, and then they're, they're done. They're you know, 25 years old, and you got everything you need. You're educated, and you go make a living. That's not the way that my, uh, my world worked. My world worked where you, you would just learn all the time. It was, and in fact, there were some things you weren't even allowed to study until you turned 40, which became the age of wisdom, because you weren't ready for them. And there, were, there was a book in particular that is read every single week, uh, I've read it more than any other, called Pirkei Avos, that uh, throughout your life, that rereading, you're reading it in different moments. You have different experiences of the book. Uh, you change along with it, um, and it reflects back to you who you might have been, maybe who, you are, who you're becoming. And that idea of being learned is really important to me uh, and seemed like the more natural way to engage with books. My grandfather was uh, uh, sold suits, um, first on the Lower East Side in Manhattan and then in Brooklyn. And he would go to work every day, work long days, come home, have dinner with the family, and then go across the street to his shul where he would study with the same group of men who studied for together for decades. It was called the Chavrusa, which the root of that word is friend. And the friendship that happens over books in that community is of critical importance. And that was his job was, had nothing to do with it. And yet, he was one of the most learned men in, the in a very learned neighborhood. And that model for me was really important. So when it became time to uh, figure out my career, I was completely uninterested in answering that question. I just wanted to be among books. Um, I had no interest in uh, going to college. I had no interest in being a part of any um, degree program that would say, here you are, you are educated. My interest was in being among books, being an enthusiast, finding like-minded people who wouldn't talk to me about it because I was an introvert. I am an introvert, and I don't want to talk to anyone. I just want to be among the books and other people who are among the books. And then say, well, this is what I could do. It's blue collar, which I really like. And, uh, and I ended up a bookseller before I knew it. And unlike you, and I think it would be helpful to the audience, so I'm, I'm really honored to be in conversation with you because you are a bookseller, you've, um, and you, are, you came to it much later than I did. 
And I think it might be interesting to share just a little bit about your journey to book selling uh, to contrast uh, our different approaches. Yeah, Jeff warned me he would try to turn the tables and ask me the questions, but as a, you know, a one-time journalist, I'm, I'm always on guard when <laughs> when I'm interviewing somebody and they try to get me, put me on the spot. But they're anyway. All, they're all gotcha questions. That's, a, that, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's, that, that's not a hard question. No, I was a journalist for, for 30 years and um, really never uh, expected to um, go into business of, of any kind. Um, but, you know, one thing led to another and after I, I left the, the Washington Post, politics and prose was uh, put up for sale and um, to, to my, my surprise and my wife's surprise as much as anybody's, we. We ended up uh, assuming assuming ownership. It's and when you think about it, it's not that big a leap from journalism to book selling. It's you know both are still part of the larger uh, world of words and and ideas. Um, and um, you know as I was telling Jeff before we we came out here, you know some of my my biggest thrills are to see some of my former colleagues come out with their books and to host them here at PNP. And there are a lot of journalists you know writing writing books these days. Um, there, 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 there is, though, a, a, a difference of, of, of running a bookstore than being a journalist. I mean, first and foremost, this is a, a business. And, you know, you've got staff responsible, uh, um, uh, you know, you're responsible for their well-being, so you have to make sure that the <laughs> bookstore stays in, in the black, um, uh, but which um, can sometimes have its challenges. You know, not only in a pandemic, uh, but even in, in normal times. So we'll talk some more about that um, uh, 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 shortly. So, um, okay, so you became became a, a bookseller, and, you, and and that's entitled you to be immersed uh, among books. You know, at the office all day long. Not that uh, we all have much time to read the books while we're while we're working. Uh, but but um, uh, talk about uh, a few of the other bookstores you. Uh, worked for before you came to se seminary uh, co-op bookstores, and then I, I really want to focus on on seminary because it's a it's a it's a really a particular kind of, of bookstore. Yeah, absolutely, and um, maybe I'll answer both of those questions, and it, it actually um, will flow very very easily. So I uh, first went to the seminary co-op, which is on the south side of Chicago in 1994, um, and I was immediately struck by not just the presence of books in that space, and I don't know if anyone has been to the store, uh, the old store in the basement. Excellent, excellent. So the old store, so I say the old store, 10 years ago we moved across the street. Um, but I, in that, I'll come back to what the store was and is, uh, but I had never seen a space like that before. It was um, th in the basement, there's only books, there are all of these, it's like a labyrinthine uh, uh, a store where anywhere they could find to put books, it was behind a, a pipe or uh, they built bookshelves out of God knows what. I mean, it was just, uh, have you ever been to the space, the old no, space? No, I haven't, okay. I've, seen, I've seen pictures. Oh, yeah, so you know, you know what it looks like. And I hadn't started in bookselling yet. Six months later is when I first, I first started um, as a bookseller and I really, I've, I've done almost nothing else since then. And what I recognized after um, being in bookstores here and there that were more neighborhood bookstores, I worked for Barnes & Noble through the 90s and I kept moving around and that was part of the appeal for me was I just kept, got to keep moving uh, and keep my job and keep my benefits and all of that, which was incredible, um, was that I really wanted to be a, a academic adjacent. I wanted to be in the university community because the books that I was interested in were books on philosophy and religion and uh, literature, poetry and criticism, essays, things like that. Um, and I, to me, I'm, uh, you know, I'm Catholic, I, I'll read whatever, uh, lowercase c, I'll read whatever. Uh, and I feel really good about that. And I want anyone who is interested in whatever books they're looking for to be able to come in. But my, my tendency was to read academic titles. So prior to my work at the seminary co-op, I was at the Stanford bookstore running their stores. Um, and then prior to that, I was at University of California at Berkeley uh, and was able to build, especially starting at UC Berkeley, recognize the way in which a bookstore is a community center, um, that there is that there are constituencies um, that matter deeply. It's not just the customer at the register that is the primary purpose, and it's not just the sale of the books that's the primary purpose. It was actually there that I recognized that this is not, um, it's not retail, like you were saying. It's not retail. It actually is a cultural uh, organization. It is a, a community space, uh, and interestingly, the last four store, last three stores that I've operated, 
um, have not been owned um, within community spaces um, or owned by an individual. They've either been institutionally owned or uh, the co-op was a member-owned co-op and now it's a not-for-profit bookstore. Um, so I'll speak to the Seminary Co-op unless you have a specific question about it because I, I ended up right back there. But uh No, no, well you pr you've, you've touched on uh, uh, sort of what distinguishes it from mm -hmm. a number of other bookstores, what's special about it. Uh, you know, when you were talking about the books sort of being crammed here and everywhere, it, it, you know, one of the um, s still qu uh, questions that I've never been able to figure out, maybe you have an answer to it, is what is, uh, what is the ideal size for a bookstore? You know, because in my experience, whether you walk into a small bookstore or a giant bookstore like Powell's uh, or The Strand, you're going to find books from floor to ceiling crammed everywhere. It just, that just seems to be the nature of a bookstore. That wh whatever size a bookstore will fill up to the limit of how many books it can hold. But do you, have you ever thought about like what is the optimal size for a bookstore? I, I love that question, and part of why I love that question is it, it speaks to um, you get to think about what is the purpose of a bookstore actually. And so, if there's an ideal size, it's, it's presumably there's there's a purpose to it. Um, I'm going to take a step back before I answer that, and I'll come to it, which is. Um, Sharing a little bit about the history of the seminary co-op because I want to get to this question of what is the purpose of a bookstore and what is the purpose today of a bookstore uh, in 2022. Um, the seminary co-op was founded 60 years ago by students from the Chicago Theological Seminary who were trying to game the system. What they realized is if they came together to get their course books, they could get course books cheaper and they get obscure course books that might have been harder to get through their local stores cheaper if they pretended they were wholesalers. And so they became wholesalers uh, and sold books to each other, basically. Um, and they were basically just trying to get things cheaper and, uh, and more obscurely. As the, and the bylaws were founded as a member-owned co-op for the seminaries in and around the Hyde Park neighborhood of the south side of Chicago. And that was it. You couldn't even go outside the neighborhood. You couldn't even go to the University of Chicago. It was just the seminaries. We ignored that. We were uh, basically operating illegally. I think I can say that uh, now um, for 58 years uh, because we were selling books that weren't for the seminary and we were not actually uh, acknowledging what the purpose of that store was. I started in 2014 and I was asking the question as along with the community saying, why member-owned co-op and why do we even need these stores anymore? Um, we can get obscure books uh, online easily, uh, usually cheaper, um, depending on how you look at cost. And What's the pur what's the purpose, right? So, Seminary Co-op was my, in some way, platonic ideal of a bookstore. Um, and what I love about it is we have about 100,000 volumes. There are mostly uh, only academic, scholarly, literary, and um, uh, literary books. Uh, and 99.9% .9 are books in the store, of the products are books. So the only things that we carry in the store that are not books are like Seminary Co-op swag. Uh, T-shirts and, and, and coffee mugs. Well, uh, well let it, uh, explain to everybody why that's really extraordinary because, yeah. I mean, as you've noticed, I mean, even you walk around PMP, you see a lot of non-book stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, greeting cards mm -hmm. and um, puzzles, puzzles and, and shirts and hats with our logo on them. Um, and, you know, if you go to another a number of other independent bookstores, you see even a higher percentage of non-book items. I mean, to be a bookstore and, and have 99% books, is pretty unusual, and it, it's it's it, 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 it's it kind of defies the laws of economics, doesn't it? Right. Well, it, it shouldn't. It sure does, and that's actually a, that's a big part of it. That's exactly right. And actually, you have a really nice selection of socks, which is so interesting because that became such a big bookstore about four or five years ago. Bookstores were really into socks, and they're actually awesome socks. Like they're you know with good messaging. And I, I, I remember because we didn't sell socks at the store, and I, I went to book people actually in Austin. There was a university press conference out there, and book they people they have like baskets of socks. They have a whole wall of socks, and they were great. And I was like. Th what is this? Go what's going on with the bookstores and the socks? Anyway, it was, it was a cool thing. Um, but here's the here's the issue, uh, and the question is right about the economic model. So why do we need a bookstore in the 21st century? What what is the point? And because the books are easy to find, um, we recognize that we don't. No reader needs a bookstore to buy books, right? And then to your point, Brad, like we can't we can't live on the sale of books alone. And if you could. Perhaps you wouldn't, perhaps. I mean, the gifts are wonderful, and the gift selection here is, fan is particularly fantastic. But if it is an economic necessity, not a curatorial decision, to carry those socks and those puzzles and those greeting cards, then there's something wrong. Um, 
The other piece that's wrong in differentiating the stores and thinking about the economics of it is looking around here, I don't know, you probably have 75,000 books, uh, something like that. It's a, it's a really great, great selection here from downstairs as well. Um, so we carry 100,000 books. The average independent bookstore in the country, and we're both um, uh, very much involved with the American Booksellers Association who, who share these numbers, the average independent bookstore in the country, so we're talking about the best bookstores in the country, um, keep books on their shelves for 120 days on average. And in order to, um, we usually have to pay for those books around six, 60 days, usually at the most. The seminary co-op um, has 280 days that we leave books on the shelf, and that includes books that sell, it's an average, so it's books that sell really quickly. We do about 700 author events pre-pandemic. We have course books. We have a lot of books that sell quickly, so the number is actually really a lot higher. Uh, the idea that books require patience on the shelf, no retailer would tell you that's a good idea, right? That is a really terrible idea if you're a retailer. And so for us, in the becoming a not-for-profit, there was a recognition that the retail model, which we inherited, we never built it deliberately in order to support bookstores, the retail model where we buy at cost from the publisher and then we sell it at list price, and the difference between those two is how we make our living, is wrong. Because what we're selling is, is no, it's no longer books. We're no longer selling books. What we're selling is a space. We're selling the browse, which I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about. We're selling the presence of books, and we're selling the community, all of you sitting here today, the community that comes together over their shared love of browsing and reading. That actually is the product. The books can be bought elsewhere, and how can we build a model that recognizes the work that the bookseller does? And I'd like to speak a little bit about that, if that's okay, about what bookselling what booksellers do. Um. Sure, sure, yeah, I, about, uh, about while we're still talking about sort of inventory, um, you know, you just spent a little bit of time in, uh, in your book talking about another fact that maybe a lot of customers might not be aware of, which is that, um, you know, uh, in a bookstore, um, we c uh, c carry a wide range, you know, not just the latest books, but, but um, older books, sometimes going back, you know, centuries um, and um, so much of our sales are not just the are not dependent on the, the best selling books the ones we sell lots of copies of but the ones that we um, we sell many books just just one copy of many titles uh, in fact there's a statistic in your book maybe you can uh, recall for everybody that that captures this point and why this is this is so revealing a, of the challenge that we face. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so th the statistic is uh, that of the 28,000 books that we sold at the Seminary Co-op the last full year we were in operation uh, before the pandemic, 17,000 were uh, one copy to one customer that entire year. And in thinking about it, even as a business model, so again, it's not we're not retailers, but it's not because we're trying to like keep something that nobody wants on the shelves. People want it. We sold 17,000 books. Of just one copy. One copy. So the books, they ripened on the shelves. Right? They waited to just the right moment when that reader found them. And I would argue that they've earned their keep all along because the browsage is what brings people in. And so those books sitting on the shelves a retailer would say they didn't earn their money, they didn't turn over, so we need to m get them off the shelves. But I, I don't know how many people looked at them, how long it took for that, that reader to engage with that book until they thought, oh, I'll take it home, I'll take it out for a walk around the block, something like that, and then, and we, then we bring it back in. Um, and that notion, and I, I want to go back to my, my childhood for just a moment because it's one of the things I'm so passionate about personally, so I came up in an Orthodox community and we had a canon and there were the same books that we read. Everyone read the same books. And I think that is not for me. Let me just say it that way. That's not for me. And the bookstores, there are havens for the heterodox. That is an important concept. Uh, everyone comes in and sees the same books in every shop. I think there's something wrong. Well, you know, um, even with this idea that there are lots of lots of titles that we carry that are just fit or just 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 one customer may be interested in um, uh, it doesn't mean that you know what you see in a bookstore isn't a very carefully curated collection in fact you you have this uh, very uh, well put uh, line in your book where you say we connoisseurs know the difference between 
a storehouse of books and a carefully assembled collection. Um, how, how do booksellers achieve this uh, carefully assembled collection? I really regret that line because I actually s I put that line in and I actually named two stores, one of which is no longer with us and one of which is. The one that is, and I'm going to apologize publicly, is John King's bookstore in Detroit where I spent the first day of the tour. I went to Detroit. It's one of my favorite bookstores in the country. It's a huge warehouse. They have, he must have a million, literally a million books there. And I write, uh, I, th I, was try I thought I was being charming and I wasn't. It was like, there's like 50,000 great books in that store. <laughs> like, you know, and, and give the anyway, I spent the afternoon there and it was great and John's wonderful and he, he doesn't care. He, he, uh, but anyway, um, but, th but there is a difference. There's a difference between, uh, so you know, if you have all the space, uh, we look at, I, I think, um, I don't know how much of the buying you do, but the buyers, they look at 30,000 uh, books every year that have been released that year. And then we also look at, at the co-op, 30,000 books that have uh, been released in prior years that are selling that we're looking to restock. And a store could bring in all 30,000 if they had the space. Um, we have the space. Uh, you have the space. We could bring in 30,000. Um, that's not what it means to, to be a bookseller. And so kind of getting into the work of bookselling, it's it was clear to me in, in thinking about what do we do if we're not retailers. The retailers buy cheap and sell dear. Like that, the idea is, you know, get it, get it at the lowest low and then sell it at the highest high. Uh, that's not what we do. It's not what we're good at. Uh, if we were good at it, we would actually sell something that had a real margin, right? This is not uh, this is not a good business. Uh, the quality for us is discernment, and that actually is the the primary thing that that distinguishes uh, the bookseller from the the retailer. And it's discernment. And then what actually are the, the things that we need to be focused on? It's filtration, taking those 30,000 and deciding these are the 3,000 books I'm going to bring in this year. And um, so filtering out all of the, the things that don't quite fit your community, then the selection of here are the books that we're going to bring in and when. Then the assemblage, which I think you do a beautiful job of in just walking through. I, I've loved browsing in this space and thinking about like the, the, the essays and criticism section that I just think was really well done. And that particular assemblage is, is, is interest to me. But even the assemblage on the tables and seeing like what the book groups all are talking about. And it's a very interesting conversation that happens there. And then the last quality is enthusiasm. And the enthusiasm, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the most enjoyable parts of the job. But it's the thing that, that helps ensure that the right reader, or the reader will get the right book at the right time. It's getting to know the bookseller and having that relationship and that engagement. Now, I want to speak a little bit to the economics of, of a bookseller acknowledging that if we're retailers, then that is the, the business model that it's built upon. So we were talking earlier about uh, gifts and sidelines. So uh, we carry 99% books at the Seminary Co-op. The average independent bookstore carries 81% books. Uh, and this is in order to be profitable the ideal model is that there's almost one out of five items is a non-book. In addition, and I know you are um, known for paying a better than just about any bookstore in the country, um, but still we're paying retail wages, all of us are. We pay $15.25 for booksellers for starting wages, and that's about 70% higher than the industry average. I just want to let that sink in. So $15.25. We pay managers at our stores $50. $51,000 who have been there for 10 years in the business are the best in the business. $51,000. We're paying almost 60%. Uh, to be, uh, I think it's 60%. It's a significant inc uh, uh, increase above what the industry average is. It's obscene. And it's not because we're like evil. It's because the model doesn't make sense. In addition, um, Book prices have been depressed so much and thinking about what um, what the cost of a book is, and not that anyone should be paying more for books, but if we're retailers and the book price is $25 for a book and we're paying $15 to bring it in, that's not a model that can support this work. What then, and I know that many of us are having these conversations throughout the industry and we're all, a lot of us are reimagining bookstores and ha how to make them work. What then is the model where we can actually pay and not better wages than we're doing, but professional wages, where 50,000 is the minimum to even like to get started, but it goes up from there and over the next 10 years to see that continue to grow. How do we shift that conversation and pay for it in a way that's not about retail? Because in retail, I mean, we lose a quarter million dollars every year uh, and have been for a while. And that was when we were even paying $10 an hour. Uh, so how do we build this model that can actually professionalize the industry? Yeah. Well, I, I, I want y you to answer that, um, 
but I'm not sure we've totally exhausted <laughs> uh, nailed the argument about, okay, so if bookstores in the 21st century really aren't needed for people to buy books, why, why are they important? Why, why do good bookstores still matter? Yeah, well, why are you here and not somewhere else? It's a good question. And uh, my, my argument is that we, we matter because of the browse. Um, the browse is the product. And the browse only exists if booksellers can create it. And the community, I think, and I will say this, and I don't mean it in a um, didactic way at all, but I, I think the because it's a community space, I think it, it is our responsibility to maintain them. And I feel like during COVID, so many of us recognize the interconnectedness of every, uh, every part of our local communities and wanting to keep things going and got a little bit more in each other's business. I don't know if you, you all did a... Um, a GoFundMe, but many bookstores did GoFundMe's, and it was shocking to me how uh, we raised about $300,000 in a, a week. Um, City Lights, one of the best booksellers in the country, raised, I think, $600,000 in a week, and it was $20 here, $20 there, and it was just, it was the community saying, we need you here. Um, now, we went nonprofit in 2019, about six months before the pandemic hit, but we've not made a profit in 25 years, actually, and we were consistently asking for help from our community. We're asking for charity from our community because we were struggling. It's like, no, we weren't. And I, I came into it late, so I, none of this was a, a defensive for me. I, I loved the stores for years. I came into it late. I said, not struggling. In fact, they're, they should be doing, we should be losing more. We actually should be losing 600,000 or a million because we're paying too little and we don't have enough books on the shelf, right? I mean, that's exactly, and, and why shouldn't the community invest in the store and pay and find value in the work that we were doing, which is creating the browse, the browsing experience and a community predicated upon books. You have a great section in your book where you describe <laughs> different kinds of browsing. Uh -huh. can, 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 can you uh, say a little bit about that here? What, what are the, some of the different kinds of browsing? Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I do a taxonomy of, of browsers, and, and one of the things that we see um, you know, from, from our vantage point is just the, the flight path of, uh, of your flight path as you come in the, the store. and. You know, and we have like the Flanor who just wanders the streets. We have the Pilgrim who's you know looking for something. They they don't know, know what it is, but they're gonna find it. Um, we have we have the uh, uh, Sandpiper, and the Sandpiper. This is from an Elizabeth Bishop poem, where the Sandpiper is just pecking at the at the moat of dust, uh, the moat of sand, and looking for that something, something, something that they'll find. We have the Chef, who I, I I'm often a chef. I often I kind of don't want to do it with my own book, but. I mean, often you'll you know open it up and see how it feels inside and the smell of it. Is it ripe yet? Right, get, kind of get a sense of it. Uh, and so, yeah, I think there there are many. And I somebody asked me to diagnose them. I was like, what kind of browser am I? <laughs> and I was like, you're all of them. We're all all of them. Yeah, it's you know it's a mood. It's a mood that you wander. And I I almost want to. I mean, I can imagine. I almost want to guess. This could be a good bookseller parlor game of guessing what kind of browser you are. <laughs> now I'm gonna guess. Can I? Can we turn off the camera? Turn off the camera. <laughs> I'm going to guess that on, on any given day, more than another, that um, you have like a, a little bit of the flanor. He likes just wandering around, ca gazing, gazing through the shelves. But I think there's a sandpiper in you because uh, as someone who has you know, done some seri serious work and you get focused on something, you go deep, 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 and that there's some mix of those two. Yeah, that's uh, good. Do I do? Yeah, that's that I, 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 I recognize myself in that description. Okay, um, so... Uh, I also want to tease out this idea of you know uh, the importance of bookstores uh, uh, as a place that cultivates uh, you know such uh, values as community and friendship. Um, and you write that good bookstores reflect their communities, but the best bookstores create also create their communities. What what what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, I think. I haven't spent a lot of time in this neighborhood, so I, I really can't speak to it. And I'd be curious if you have thoughts uh, after I sh share mine about what this store has done. Uh, so City Lights is an example I can use. Uh, been around for um, 70 years, I think. Um, something like that. Fif uh, 50 years. Uh, actually, I'm honestly not sure. It's over half a century. Um, and they're in the North Beach neighborhood of San Francisco. And that neighborhood was not a haven for literature, radical literature, poetry. Um, there were enough people who cared about it that when City Lights was founded by Lawrence Berlinghetti, they came. People started showing up. 
But then people would come from all over the country to be around the City Lights aura. And then, as San Francisco changed over the, over the decades, it, North Beach is still that corner in Kerouac Alley and the, the bars and restaurants there. That City Lights created that. I would argue, and this is something that, uh, again, I've only been at the co-op um, less than 10 years, so none of it had nothing to do with any of it. Um, I would argue that the Hyde Park neighborhood in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, is what it is, not because of the University of Chicago, of course it doesn't hurt, but you know, New Haven doesn't have a bookstore like ours. Uh, plenty of great university towns don't have a uh, bookstore like ours. That it is this singular place devoted to the life of the mind because the seminary co-op is there. The seminary co-op created that community while reflecting it. That's kind of how I mean it. Um, you know, I've got a few more questions. We're going to get a, a, a turn to the issue of you know, alternative um, models right now. Uh, but uh, please, you know, think of uh, some questions that you want to ask because uh, we're going to turn things over to, uh, to the audience here in, uh, in, a, f in a few minutes. So, um, you know, how do we save bookstores? Well, in the case of Seminary Co-op, um, I think you, you mentioned it in passing uh, earlier, but uh, uh, you, you changed the model there. Um, you know, a, few, a few years ago, you switched from uh, from being a, a co-op to being a, a, a not-for-profit. So, what 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 went into that decision, and how's that worked out? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, and I, I almost I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as a journalist, right? So, what was the I mean, the idea in journalism, the the financial model in journalism was what selling advertising. Mm -hmm. for, uh, this is in the 20th century, in order to um, move. I mean, you want to as much circulation as possible. You sell advertising, you get in front of eyes. And what was what's the work of journalism? I mean, this is you're not selling something frivolous. This is a critical civic institution, right? Right. And so what what then happened in the 21st century? And uh, what we saw is that we that model broke, mm -hmm. and it broke because it was never meant to support one of our most critical civic endeavors. And now we look around and we see what wh what the result of it is. Out of curiosity, if I may, uh, uh, put you on the spot as being uh, so adjacent to journalism, what are some of the ways in which journalists are rethinking the model, and what are some of the ways in which um, they're shifting, going away from this model that was inherited into a new model? Well, there is a not-for-profit option, too. You see some of these uh, groups of uh, journalists who used to work for uh, other news organizations, for-profit organizations, uh, getting hired, and, and, and some of these not-for-profit groups are doing s some of the best investigative journalism out there. But at the same time, you know, you have the, the biggest papers in the country, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. Um, they, they are uh, doing quite well in recent years. Um, you know, they built up their websites mm -hmm. enormously. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and there's been a lot of news, uh, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you all have noticed. So that's, that's mm -hmm. helped them. Uh, the, the papers that are still struggling, and, and, and we're losing a number of them, or the, or the smaller papers, uh, local, and local also regional local papers, and also a uh, number of the regional papers. Yeah, and, and so that's interesting. Well, and, and even like with the Times uh, and, the, and the Post, it's a subscriber model, all right? Yeah. And, and it's always interesting to me to see when that, when that paywall is lifted. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, the news actually matters now because we're going to lift the paywall, right? Yeah. We, they're thinking, we really need to know this now. What does that say about what it is when it's not lifted? And who's paying for it and who's financing it? So we don't shouldn't have everyone shouldn't have the news available uh, okay maybe not uh, maybe this is just a, it's just a marketplace and that's how it works but the argument that I um, I'm not making any arguments the, the book is a celebration I'm really not not I don't know much other than how to run a bookstore kind of sort of uh, and lose a lot of money doing it um, but but it, it, the only thing that I, I wonder is you know there are models that um, we have uh, in this country and, and throughout history that don't assume that everyone is going to pay for everything directly in that way. Um, I, I uh, imagine an alternative universe where we don't have public libraries. And I'm up here saying, hey, here's what we need to do. We need to just spend all this money buying land for public libraries, right? So this is a 19th century model. And buying land, and we just, it's just free. Anyone can come and, come and go. We're gonna put books on the shelf, and they're gonna be in every neighborhood. And that is going to be our model for libraries. And you just get laughed out of every uh, bank and, and front of it. Like, you could not even begin that conversation. 
part of where I'm optimistic is uh, watching journalism in particular, actually more than any other industry, uh, I think that's the best analog for us because it was such a messed up model to begin with, just like ours. And it is so critically important and we're seeing what happens when we, when we don't have a strong, especially long form investigative journalism is critical. Uh, and so what happens when we build that up deliberately, and you've described quite a few of them, but there are a couple of other models in journalism that are exciting to me are, um, there are foundations that are not 501c3, uh, that are giving money to long form investigative journalism, not as wealth management, which is so much of what our not-for-profit, you know, the philanthropic um, community has been about. It is really just about supporting that work and those endeavors. In addition, we're seeing some of that money go to local uh, specifically to local um, news outlets because there isn't enough local and regional news. And that is not, it's not a business. It shouldn't be a business. It is part of what it takes to create an educated populace and, um, and an informed populace. And we need careers for journalists. Uh, you know, you, you were um, really good at what you did, but also really lucky to join at a time where you can have a long-term career as a journalist, as a young journalist, to look out and see the future and think, well, you know, how am I going to make it work? It's, it's a lot scarier. And that's true for booksellers as well. And uh, I've been very lucky to have a career in bookselling. So our model is a not-for-profit bookstore whose mission is bookselling. We are not 501c3, uh, partly because the IRS is not incented to or necessarily have might not have the discernment to figure out the difference between us and uh, a bookstore that might not have these same cultural missions because we, we all look like we resemble retailers, right? But we're really not all retailers. And that we are taking the work of a bookseller, that filtration, selection, assemblage, and enthusiasm, and we're trying to sell it as a service, i.e., uh, we, uh, we build libraries, we do programming with um, like Chicago Humanities Festival, uh, we work with them not as their retail vendor, but as their programming partner, and they pay us a fee on, the, um, on that work itself. Um, what does it mean to be in community with others and bring authors or um, book collections, things like that, out into the world? We have uh, 50,000 subscribers on our emailing list, which is probably fewer than you have. Uh, it's one, it's one of the biggest uh, stores in the country, um, but it's, it's a large list. And what does it mean to get those books in front of uh, the readers and how do we think about using that enthusiasm to get those books in front of readers I work with uh, other cultural organizations and cultural leaders to think about community building as well and to think to acknowledge that that work is not the traditional work a retailer does is important now one thing I do want to say and this is a, this, and it's in the book and I, I don't want to create the wrong impression every Books, just about every bookstore, in every you know, community bookstore that we're describing is a cultural institution, whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit, whether they're family-owned or owned, e and I would even include Barnes & Nobles in those. I mean, like, there are, they are cultural institutions. They carry collections that are really important. Um, but there is a difference in the model where we're carrying the sorts of books with the patients that we have and serving particular kinds of community. And it's not just, I talked about academic and scholarly books. For those of you who know the South Side of Chicago, it is historically underserved. And we're carrying books for underserved communities and we're bringing people in from neighborhoods that are not Hyde Park and to show what these spaces can do over time. And we've raised up new readers and writers and educators and community builders in those stores. And that, to me, is a critical part as well of the work. Well, well, so Seminary made this switch to this not-for-profit model a few years ago. So have you been able now to you know, pay a more decent wage to your staff in the since? Is this working out for you? Well, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, part of it, uh, we're just getting started. So, you know, 2019, we uh, made the switch. Uh, COVID hit a few months later. And to be honest, I mean, we've never in a been in a better cash position. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have f uh, less than half of the books we normally would carry on the shelf. Uh, no, we almost went under. I was sure we were going to... I had one payroll in the bank in mid-March of 2020, and that was like normal for us. We'd have one payroll in the bank because all the money is in the books for mm -hmm. the course books are starting, and we have a huge event season as do you this time of year uh, normally. And I was like, okay, well, this is going to be the plan to ramp down and finally close up shop. You know, we made it six years. No one, no one thought we'd go this far. But I've never been more optimistic about the future, and I think that we just this year are in earnest beginning the conversation. And so, I mean... I'm going to be honest, I, I didn't think I was going to talk about this on the trail, but since you're asking and you're so interested, this is just a cash grab. I actually don't even care if you read it. I just want money. And you know what <laughs> money I want? I don't want 20 bucks for the book. I want $10 million, and that's a real number. I want a $10 million endowment. 
for the seminary co-op. And you know what? It's really not that much. And you know how I know it's not that much? Is I work in, in this world in philanthropy and the university, and I see what, what money is out there. And to have $10 million for in perpetuity to have a store like this in our community, it's a bargain. It's a bargain. So anyway, any of y'all who have that money, uh, I, I would be. Yeah, and since listen, we're just throwing our hat in no, the ring out there, I'd like to. No, <laughs> but it, but this is a different this is a different question, right? And if you were established as a nonprofit, like what would that look like? I'll, like, I'll go. If someone wants to give me ten million, but I'll this is but this is this is the point, though, right? I, I want to. This is actually you're joking, and I want to make this point because I think it's important. You are stewarding a store that predates you that could have gone out of business, and many of these stores do. And what would it be? And I th so there's a great bookstore in. Um, uh, in Palo Alto, in Memo Park, Palo Alto, uh, called Kepler's. They moved a couple of times. I, I forget where they are now. And uh, someone named Praveen Madan, we both know. Um, I mean, that store, and I lived out there when they were about to go out of business in 2002. And then in 2003, I'm making these years up, but it's around then. And then, and then again, and then Praveen came in and he saved that place. Yeah. And he didn't save it because he wanted to own it. Just like you didn't buy it because you want to make money. You, you and Lyft have bought it because you want to steward it for the next generation. And so on some level, yes. What would it be to turn this store into a community bookstore? And, and that $10 million is not, to be very clear, it is not about filling my pockets. Uh, and it's not about filling your pockets. Yeah. This is about creating an endowment that would then in perpetuity allow for these stores to exist where the staff, the, the managers aren't making $50,000. They have the exorbitant sum of maybe $70,000, 75. I mean, we're talking about low wages here still, even with that. And the th that is actually the goal uh, over the next five years is we want to build that model and we want to establish that so that other bookstores, especially like younger booksellers in their 20s and 30s and 40s who love this business and all of them are way more educated than I am and they could do th whatever they want to make money and they just want to be booksellers because they're really good at it, they're really passionate about it. And we want to build a model where those booksellers can come up and you've raised up, I mean, yeah. I was at, uh, I've <coughs> been at, I don't know how many stores in just this week of people who've worked for you, with you, uh, for the store, uh, and have built their own bookstores. It's uh, amazing, uh, the, yeah. the, the tree that you, you know, uh, yeah. all these no, no, well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I was having a little fun with Jeff there, but this is a very serious proposal. And oh, it's a serious proposal. Yeah, and he's thought a lot about this, and he's absolutely right. There is a lot of money out there, charitable money, and, um, and I think bookstores, if they're structured, uh, as uh, Jeff suggests, really are very uh, eligible and great um, – uh, great, uh, it could do a lot with, with those funds. Uh, Can I jump on that? I know you want to turn to the audience, but yeah. jump on that very quickly. And one of the things I revere my predecessors, uh, and my immediate predecessor was there for 43 years. And I just want to say, again, I really do, you're stewarding these stores. One of the things that happens at a Kepler's, at a Politics and Prose, at City Lights, that w the succession plan is impossible because there aren't people who can come on after. And so I, and I, and I, I talk about this in the book, and I think it's critically important. We are all booksellers. All of you are booksellers, by which I mean it is your responsibility, not just ours, to keep these stores going and to support these new stores uh, in their communities and to help build them. And if we see them as a retailer and that where we can get customer service and buy a thing, well, then that we won't have these spaces anymore because we don't need it for that. If we see it as a cultural endeavor, where a gift can circulate throughout the space and we can steward it for a little while and leave it to the next generation, well then, I think we have a shot and you need to help, and I'm not saying give us money, I'm saying advocate, shift the rhetoric and think differently about what these stores are. Yeah. All right, um, we've got some time uh, left for questions from you all. There's the microphone. Um, who wants to start us off? Thanks so much for being with us and for all of your thinking on this vital topic. I was uh, hoping that you could speak to uh, the differences between uh, primarily new and primarily used bookstores, uh, whether you think they have different uh, teloses and the applicability of your model uh, to uh, the latter especially. Thanks for that question. And it's going to be a really short answer because the, the short answer is I have no idea and I'll tell you why. I love nothing more than a used bookstore and in fact, if I could have gotten a used bookseller to hire me, I'd be a used bookseller today. It is my favorite space. And a funny story for anyone who knows the Berkeley community, I was the director of the UC Berkeley Bookstore, which is a $20 million store. Uh, and it's the campus bookstore that's owned by the students. Uh, uh, and I would walk down the street to Moe's Books and I would beg them to hire me to just to shelve books and just, I'm just like, give me like 
10 hours a week. I just need to be in this space. And they wouldn't, ha over and over again, I, I offered to do it with, uh, I'll, I'll work for books. I just want to be, in my I couldn't get it. Um, I, I have too much respect for the used book uh, business to, to uh, be able to speak to it. I do spend a lot of time with booksellers, and I, I do speak with them. And their laments are different than ours. Uh, it has everything to do with online and what has happened with uh, how online has shifted um, their, they, it's no longer necessary to have the knowledge of the, you know, the, the, um, the worth of these, th these finds, and there are these you know, scanners that you can do to see how much things are selling for. Uh, and it's ruined the business and the art of it. That's a very different lament from ours, and I, I'm s very sympathetic to it. I will say that some of my favorite bookstores in Chicago, my favorite used bookstores in Chicago, has recently, two of them have recently, recently been bought by amazing booksellers, but they're turning them into new bookstores. And I'm like, no, we have enough new bookstores. We can't lose our great used bookstores. So anyway, I don't know enough about the business, and this is really just new bookstores, and it's just bookstores that only carry books and only carry um, what is no like serious books, which is not a matter of... Um, like it's not a value judgment. There are plenty of bad, serious books, and there are plenty of great, not serious books. Mad Magazine is a, my, my example of the type of reading that's just purely entertaining and brilliant. Uh, might not all be Mad Magazine fans, but I'm just talking about my 13-year-old self here. Uh, anyway, so I don't know is the short answer. Hello. Um, I just got here like five minutes ago, so I don't totally know what's going on, <laughs> but I thought it was a great coincidence because I'm currently like doing job applications to do like a part-time like bookseller job like that's what i want to do right now Great. uh so what advice do you have to be like a good like you know bookseller and like get hired and stuff i don't know kindness and enthusiasm that's cool that's all i got kindness and enthusiasm Thank you so much. I, I was curious if you could um, tell us your favorite hand selling experience with a customer. What, what, what book was that and like what made the experience special to you? Are we both going to take a stab at this? Because I've got I've got dozens of them. No, so no, go ahead. If you if you if you chime in after, that's great. Well, one of the things that is particularly um, interesting about being in bookstores is we hand sell to each other all the time. And one of the things that I love, and you see these things, they kind of just, books sort of just kind of become part of the ether, right? And um, so, for instance, Clarice Lispector, who is a, a Brazilian novelist, if you haven't read her, she's wonderful. Uh, one person got the fever for Clarice Lispector, and suddenly everyone had the fever for Clarice Lispector. And I would see in the neighborhood her books from the everywhere now new direction started putting them out again there was some interest there um but it was it, it that was the specific thing and i my hand selling experience around it i love her work uh the first book of hers that i read is a novel called the passion according to gh which is um it's a riveting plot a woman sits in a room and watches a cockroach die for 200 pages that's it the whole book and it is so gorgeous. And there was a community builder, somebody who worked in the nonprofit sector, uh, funding, and it's actually this exact kind of thing we're talking about journalism, but with uh, community, organiz community organizing groups, funding uh, small nonprofits. And that was the idea behind it specifically. And she moved into the university administration as part of the civic engagement office and wanted to, I just wanted to be among like the life of the mind and was really interested in things for their own sake and didn't want to like think about you know, reading for a cause or a purpose. And I said, Clarissa Spector, Passion According to GH. That was, that's one example. I, I could go on. I actually saw, I don't know who does the windows here, but we're walking past the window on the street, and I just, I, I mean, I love the existence of this store. And there is uh, Audre Lorde's collected poems, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's a bookseller puts that out there, right next to Fernando Pessoa's a little larger than the universe that, that's uh, collected. And I go over to the poetry shelf, and of course, there's the Alberto Cairo uh, version of Fernando. So you all writing this down, right? This is called book selling. I just want you all to know these are all like great, great, great books. Um, I, I, I uh, see we only have a couple minutes left, Jeff, and, but I didn't want to uh, end without you talking a little bit about your own experience writing the book. You know, we were talking also about this before we came out, and, and um, uh, you'd said that you never really saw yourself as a writer, but here, here you've, you've written this book. Um, it's uh, 
getting a lot of support from fellow booksellers. Certainly, it's gotten some really good reviews. Um, how did that happen, and what was the process like for you? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've been writing since I'm 13 years old. I have a practice. I love writing. Um, I uh, never expected to publish, and I um, still am surprised that I did. Uh, really, though, for me, it was uh, a recognition that there was a need to shift the rhetoric about what a bookstore is and does, and um, and the kinds of books. So a couple of you have been to the seminary co-op. I think that the largest point for me was I was trying to advocate on behalf of something that existed. And having spent all this time in Silicon Valley where um, students, I mean, 22-year-old uh, students would walk into um, buildings on Sand Hill Road with a deck with like 10 pages of slides and raise you know, millions of dollars in order to fund their ideas. And meanwhile, I had this reality that I couldn't get funded. I said, well, I need to try and replicate the the experience of browsing the store in, in, in a book, and that really was the idea behind it. And you know, in this e like a space like this, which is incredible. And earlier, I was at Loyalty Books, which is a wonderful new bookstore and a bookstore that um, you you know worked with for a while, who then opened up her own store. And it's, if you haven't been, it's fantastic and it's completely different. And these all these stores are singular spaces. And what does it mean to be in these singular spaces? There is a difference at the Seminary Co-op, and there is a different, and there's something that I really want to uh, ensure outlives all of us and that was the idea behind writing the book and I hope it's I hope it's like also enjoyable it's not you know it's, uh, hopefully it's an enjoyable read. Uh, it truly is I mean obviously you know as a bookseller I can relate to it and a lot of us in this business can we're all really quite grateful for Jeff for carrying the banner for us but I think anybody who really enjoys shopping in, in, uh, in, in independent bookstores will uh, will find meaning as well as pleasure in this book you know one of the positive reviews of your book and Publishers Weekly. They, they called it a resonant eulogy to a changing business. But as you say at the end of your book, it's not really a eulogy. It's a, a celebration and a justification of good, good bookstores. And um, it, uh, you, you really you do, you do us justice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs> Please uh, fold up your chairs and uh, um, put, put, put them against something, uh, something solid. And Jeff will be up here um, signing copies, which are available for purchase at the checkout desk. Thanks again for coming.